because at the end of the day, you know, we're working with other people's uh, profiles, right? And to me, that's way more important than sort of doing something from a company brand because there's a real person, there's a real face behind who you're working with. So from our end, we've got to be make it 100% sure that we are representing the, the person in the right manner. Welcome to the Kind Boss Podcast, brought to you by Outsourcing Angel, an Australian-based social enterprise that specializes in helping business owners free up their time and reduce staffing costs, while helping to create employment opportunities for people in developing countries. Visit OutsourcingAngel.com today. Now, let me welcome your host, Lynn Padetti. Hello, kind listeners. I'm your host, Lynn Panetti. Today, we'll be speaking to a kind boss, Jeff Yang, founding director of Social Gen, the world's leading B2B social sales and marketing enablement agency. Over the past five years, Jeff has worked with hundreds of executives from globally recognized brands such as American Express, IBM, Cathay Pacific, and HP also trains thousands of B2B professionals on how to use social media to grow their personal brands online, build stronger relationships with clients and generate new business opportunities. Listen on as he shares how to develop deeper and more valuable relationships in business using digital channels. and welcome to another episode of the Kind Boss series. And today I'm so excited to chat to my good friend, Jeff Yang. Hi! (laughs) Jeff is just such a genuine kind of guy and I met him about, I don't know, six, seven years ago. After that, I just saw him thrive in the area of LinkedIn marketing and he really niched into it. He was so focused on it. And now that I finally are getting into LinkedIn, I started to talk to Jeff more and to learn more about it. And I thought, What better way is to talk to you and then share your knowledge with everyone else. So welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. And finally, you've joined the LinkedIn bandwagon. I I told you, Lynn, (laughs) I told you I'd turn you to the dark side and it's happened. Why is it that people like me who B2B took so long to get into LinkedIn? I think because, you know, LinkedIn is not as intuitive as the other social media channels and you know, a lot of people are more used to interacting on the channels like Facebook and Instagram. So LinkedIn is a bit of a weird network and a weird platform. A lot of people that I work with, they're sort of unsure of what to post and and how to post because it is a very professional network and they're quite conscious of, you know, representing themselves in in a professional manner. Whereas with Facebook and Instagram, it's a lot easier to be authentic because it's you, you know, and the platform is designed for you to be engaging with your friends and family and things like that. So I think that is the main reason why. So is it because back then LinkedIn was like almost this resume platform that I thought it was, and then it started to evolve that now it's more suitable for us to do what we do, like hang out in there and do socializing. Is that because of that? Yeah, 100%. I mean, LinkedIn, you know, came to fame because of that whole recruitment and job seeker, job finder type of process. And also it was made popular from the hirers being able to stalk the people that were <laughs> submitting for the roles. You know, the, the whole stalking thing make, made LinkedIn very popular. So yeah, it took a while for people to break out of that mindset. A lot of people are still on that mindset mm-hmm. that LinkedIn is, you know, a solely a recruitment platform. And don't get me wrong, it is. it's a massive recruitment talent acquisition platform. But, you know, now that uh, there's a lot more people on LinkedIn, different types of businesses, millennials getting on board who are, you know, very social media savvy, it's, it's become a completely different type of beast where you can use it for other purposes like lead generation or being able to market your digital initiatives. Yeah. So back then in the days, it was just like a resume almost place where you kind of get your profile set up and you never look at it again. And then till now it's a lot more engaging and you're liaising. What do you see the future of LinkedIn? I was like, is there anything that you can see or guess even if you have to? I think the future of LinkedIn is quite bright actually. And it's already evolving. LinkedIn now has a lot of the I guess, tools and other features that other social media channels have. So, you know, there's videos now you could add on LinkedIn where you weren't able to do that before. So that holds a, 
that opens a whole new uh, sort of dimension and channel for influencers becoming part of it. So I think the whole influencer community and the influence of brands are going to really grow. You know, I think it's going to be more and more used, uh, especially with COVID and people not being able to do any face-to-face networking and things like that. Now, uh, a lot more people are going to use LinkedIn as that platform to digitally network, digitally collect, uh, connect, and also promote their, their digital offerings or digital mediums like webinars and things like that. People are using LinkedIn a lot more to start promoting those types of initiatives. So yeah, I think you know just the world state that we're in at the moment is sort of forcing us to evolve how we interact on LinkedIn and other social media channels. But also LinkedIn is sort of now becoming more of normal more intuitive LinkedIn platform. So people are now more comfortable to share different types of media and more personal types of posts. Yeah, definitely. I think the world has evolved. You know, we used to put on a professional hat and then kind of a me hat. And then now we realize that, you know, the world is more modern now. We're kind of like, unless you show your personal side, yeah. I won't even do you, right? So I kind of see that that I, you know, at the beginning, I was like, how do I stay professional? But now it's more, how could I show the personal side of me so that other people connect with me and go, I like her and I'll do business with her? 100%. And I think that's the missing link, right? It's that people were thinking that they have to be someone different on LinkedIn to, you know, who they are in, in real life. And I think people are now clicking going, you know what, I could just be myself on, on LinkedIn, but just talk about more professional subjects. I don't have yes. to change myself. It's just that, you know, the stuff that I talk about or share, you know, is going to be more professional related as opposed to, you know, stuff that my dog ate for breakfast. Yeah. I'll share that on Instagram. And I must say, Lynn, you know, I've been following and I'm seeing your posts and you do it wonderfully in terms of being yourself, being authentic and using LinkedIn as a way to, to really grow your professional brand as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. You raise good on you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you raise a good point because the way I see it is that I don't want to just be on LinkedIn and start just to mass publish. And then, you know, when I first started my business, I remember kind of, I need to be on Facebook, I need to be on this, but then just doing it for the sake of doing it. Yeah. But I realized yeah. that, no, this is a platform. This is a voice. Whatever voice I bring out is a chance for me to connect with someone. So I do put a lot more effort on what am I saying to the world, right? Like, like you said, you don't just go and publish what you ate, whatever. Cause like, how is that? benefiting the, your audience or your, your target market. It's like, yes, yeah, so exactly. you're very mindful of that. Now, in terms of like a lot of people on LinkedIn now though, what, how is it that we can get through the noise? Like, like this is a new challenge of, well, we're bombarded <laughs> with too much things in, on LinkedIn and, and yeah, so how do we stand out in there? Yeah, it's a really great point. And something that is becoming a lot challenging to do because there are so many different types of audiences using LinkedIn now. You know, before it used to be really sort of mature audience, only sort of big businesses. But now, you know, small businesses are on there. You've got business owners along with employees. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole mix of audiences on, on LinkedIn. Plus that, as I said earlier, there's a whole new import of content that didn't happen before. So, you know, in the past you had some pretty good cut through, but now it is way more, more challenging. Like, you know, the other channels like Facebook is, is very challenging to get in front of your audience. So my number one tip is to be very selective with who you connect with, because if you're connecting with anyone and everyone, then you're going to be, you're going to have a very mixed and muddled audience. So when you're posting content, you're not going to have the same sort of cut through as if you were only connecting with certain people in certain industries or certain job titles or um, certain functions or people who deal in, in certain products or solutions, right? If you were only connected or had most of your connections that were uh, from a particular category, uh, professions, then your content would have a lot more cut through. Okay. with the audience, right? The second thing is personalizing your content as well. So, you know, if you're, if you're doing a post and you really want this post to be visible to, let's say, digital marketers, then in your commentary, you want to be saying, if you're a digital marketer, this is something that's going to be important to you. You want to call it out. So if, if people are skimming through their newsfeed and, and they're a digital marketer, and you know, the first line says, Hey, if you're a digital marketer, this is something that you, you want to be reading, then it's going to jump out at me more than, you know, content that doesn't, you know, personalize the, the post to myself. And the other one of course is more visual content. So LinkedIn, 
is definitely favoring video content at the moment. And that's why I see your beautiful face, Lynn, so many times <laughs> on my news feed, because all you post is videos and, 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 and images, but that's exactly what you want, right? So by understanding the content that LinkedIn favors and making sure that a lot of your posts are that format, it just means that you become more visible. You know, your, your yeah. posts are always at the top of the news feed as opposed to in the middle or down the, down the bottom. So yeah. my recommendation would be use more visual content. Yeah, I really love that. And I think one idea that I need to take away is the whole attentioning to the person I'm talking to. Because yeah. I did that once recently and yeah, I, I felt like it was direct. I knew who I was, I was talking yeah. to, but I didn't do that more. I didn't, I didn't duplicate that more, but I'm definitely <laughs> going to do that next time. Now, I know a lot of LinkedIn people doing, I mean, a lot of business owners, small business owners using LinkedIn, right? Because we're like hustling, trying to get our clientele. How are big, or big custom, a big, corporate clients using it? Because I know that's your specialty. You do social media marketing or LinkedIn marketing for more corporate clients. So yeah. how are they accessing your service? Like what do they need help with you? See the thing that big businesses, I think the, the core difference between big business and small business is that small business owners are in the mindset of doing it themselves, right? It's sort of like, oh, I need to learn it and I need to do it because I'm the business owner and, you know, I've got, I, oh, yeah, I, I we have to, time. I we to, have yeah, no yeah. But, you know, they're just they're small business owners just feel they have to wear every single hat in the business. Whereas a big business, they've got different teams, they've got different leaders. So it's sort of like, you know, marketing initiatives can be managed completely by one person or, or, or a team of people, right? It's delegated. It's not done by the person themselves. So the big difference between big business is the person that's doing the LinkedIn activity is not doing it. They're outsourcing it to us as an agency or they're outsourcing it to their assistant in the, in the company. And that's what makes the campaign successful or the activity successful because it can be consistent. Yeah. Whereas a small business owner, we find the challenges they have is they're trying to do it themselves and you know, they're, not on, you know, they, and they've also got the accounting hat on. They've got the HR hat on. They've got the sales hat on. So for them to try and do this activity themselves, it just means like anything, if it's not consistent, it's not going to work. So that's, so my advice to, to small business is, you know, create some sort of a system or a process for your LinkedIn activity. And you don't have to do it yourself. Lynn, you know, you've, you've <laughs> mastered that. I've, I've mastered that. And I'm not the smartest tool in the shed either, right? So I can do it. Anyone can do it. But then it's a matter of, of handing that to another person in your team or outsourcing it to someone like yourself, Lynn, to, to just make sure that that activity, like the connections or maybe the posting of the content is done consistently. And that way, as a small business owner, you can just spend your time just making sure that you're, the, you're able to respond to any opportunities that might come through or any questions that might come through or you know, any, any sort of partnership opportunities. Yeah, definitely. The moment I got into LinkedIn, I didn't realize just how time consuming it is because it's the, <laughs> because it's not that it's because there's so much opportunity within, right? If you post something and someone saw your profile or liked your profile or second or third connection, they're just all opportunity for you to really connect with them. But if you don't, you don't have a resource to help you with that, then you're just wasting it away. You're just posting and then doing nothing with it. So yeah, 100%. Yeah. And, and that's exactly the reason why most businesses and their social media activities don't, don't generate the results people want them to. It's because of that consistency. Because, you know, as a business owner or a small business owner, you just don't have the time. It, it take, like you said, Lynn, it takes so much time and, ex and a level of expertise to do it as well. So if you don't have the expertise and you don't have the time, then no matter what, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to generate the, the results that you want. So yeah, you either need to look at delegating or outsourcing this type of activity the, the best you can, or creating that time and energy in the day so that you can dedicate the necessary amount of time to make sure that uh, your activity is successful. Want to make a difference in others' lives? Join us in providing food, medical supplies, and daily living necessities to tribal communities living in extreme poverty in the Philippines. For as little as $50, you can feed a whole village and have peace of mind that 100% of your donations goes directly to those in need. Be a part of our OA Love Projects and visit OutsourcingAngel.com. 
And so in terms of corporate clients, I still haven't got my head around like, what do they use it for? You know, like for me, I know that I do what I need to do because then I directly get clients from, right? Yeah. But in terms of corporate clients, you know, what are they paying for to get what done for yeah. them? Yeah. Well, with corporate clients, you've got to remember when you're in that, in that league of, let's say, you know, some clients of ours are IBM, for example, and, and, and Hewlett Packard. Now, these guys are competitors, right? In that space, you don't have a lot of competitors. You've only got a handful. So the whole art of what they're wanting to achieve on LinkedIn is to become, you know, seen more as the trusted advisor. So they want, they want their senior executives or they want their team members to look more professional. If I'm IBM, I want my team to look more knowledgeable and professional in, let's say, cloud security than the Hewlett Packard team. Yeah. So that's one sort of focus for these large enterprise clients. It's, it's around gaining more market share. The other thing as well is getting in touch with key decision makers, key influencers within certain organizations. So, you know, generally speaking, these large companies have big sales teams and these big sales teams are, are very good at getting in front of and connecting with, you know, the, the lower end of the decision tree, like manager level, head of department, but it's very difficult to get to C level, right? Or very difficult to get to V level because there's so many layers underneath them. So our larger clients use us to help them cut through and get straight in front of a C level executive or a VP level or, or a key decision maker, you know, around their product and, and service solution. So that's another great thing about LinkedIn is, you know, if you've got the right professional brand, and you're authentic in your approach and you've got value to add, it can give you that cut through straight to the, to the top mm. of the, the tree. Right. So that's, that's uh, another core reason. And, and finally it's to generate opportunities, you know, meetings. So, you know, right now with large organizations, like they, a lot of budget and, and a lot of uh, resources go into digital marketing campaigns, like go here and download this content or here's a report or here's a video, but with large businesses, very rarely is, is if, if any business is done online, right? Like a large client is not going to, you know, sign on online and give a credit card to work with IBM or work with, you know, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. At, at some point, people are going to have to meet, you know, and at some point, human relationships are going to have to be built. So, you know, LinkedIn is a, is a platform to be able to build those initial relationship stepping stones, sort of like online dating, right? So, you know, call me the enterprise professional matchmaker. Uh, but think about online dating, right? It's you, you make yourself look sexy online to the person that you want to attract. You use online dating to find and connect and, and flirt or whatever, you know, you sort of value become noticeable. But then what's the final step? You have to actually go out on that date. You actually have to meet the person for that relationship to happen. You can't just constantly have flourishing relationship just online, right? So you know, LinkedIn is used, is, is a great platform to be able to create those offline opportunities like meetings or, you know, inviting people to come to like a physical event and things like that. Awesome. To my next segment, this is called the high five. I want to break it up with a little bit of fun. I know you love fun. So here goes, this is the fun. So this is a five step, uh, five question that I like to ask you. It's where you can choose this or that question, right? Answer. Okay. 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 Yeah. And uh, just elaborate a little bit because then we get to know you a little. Yeah, very simple question. But sometimes it gives people a dilemma. Okay. <laughs> question one, Singapore or Japan? Singapore. Oh, okay. Yeah. Why Singapore? Because from a business perspective, a lot of our business comes out of, out of Singapore. So for me, I'm actually, I was supposed to be relocating to Singapore this year <laughs> because of, of coronavirus. Uh, who said, no, 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 you are not going to Singapore still here in Sydney, Australia. So for me, definitely Singapore. But the other thing I love about Singapore is that it's so accessible to other parts of Asia, right? So, you know, I can, I can travel on land or by sea and, and go to a different country. Whereas with Japan, you know, it's still Asia and, and, and you still got access to Asia, but you're not as connected to all of Asia as you are with, with Singapore. And I love 
Southeast Asia. Like I love Thailand, I love Malaysia, you know, I love Vietnam, Canada, all those, all those sort of Southeast Asian countries. So for me, definitely Singapore and Japan. Yeah. And I bet, bet, bet people see you, they're like, are you Japanese or are you Singaporean? No, you're not. You're <laughs> Korean, right? You're Korean. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> South Korean, right. not North Korean. My next question <laughs> is then, Korean food or Vietnamese food? Oh, come on, girlfriend. Now, like, you know, I love Vietnamese food, but Korean is, is my jam, you know. I mean, as a kid, my mom used to make me, you know, wonderful Korean food. So it's one of those things that you just grew up with childhood memory and, and there's certain dishes that you just love. But Vietnamese food is got to be a very close second. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. I love it. I could, I could drink nuk num like water, man. That stuff. No, so liquid gold. Yeah, liquid and nuk mum means the, that sauce, fish sauce. The fish, fish sauce. That yeah, yeah, that stuff. Like, yes. you know, I, I don't know how to cook to save my life. But one thing I know how to make is nuk num. So <laughs> that just shows how much I love it. Wow, awesome, awesome. All right, third question. Waterfront mansion or mansion up on the hills? Waterfront. Waterfront. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love, I love water. So, you know, having a waterfront mansion means I would have like a boat, you know, go out fishing, swimming. So, or just, you know, just, just lounging. I, I find also water is very uh, energizing and very, and very calming as well. So yeah, for me, water over the hills. Plus, can you imagine like having to walk up and down a hill every day to get to your, <laughs> to get to your mansion? Helicopter ride up to your <laughs> All right. Fourth question. Compassion or empathy? Empathy. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel empathy is where you work on actually understanding the person and where they're from. Whereas I feel compassion is more focused on you. You know, it's like, oh, you know, you might see someone that is, for example, you might see someone in a wheelchair and you might think it's a compassionate thing to, you know, help them to, you know, roll up a hill or something of that sort of, that sort of nature, right? But in reality, you know, that person in the wheelchair might not want help, you know, might want to know that they've got all the spirit and energy to, to do things themselves, you know what I mean? So if I was empathetic to that person, I would understand where they are at and then go, okay, yes, you do want, you know, uh, being empathetic would mean, yes, I understand that you do need assistance and you can provide assistance or no, you're not, you know, you're, you don't need assistance. Right. Whereas, yeah. Whereas compassion, I think it's just, you're just going, Oh, look, I'm going, Oh, I feel sorry for that person. Or I, I want to show that person some compassion from my view, which I prefer to spend the time to understand the person. Wow. Themselves. That is so deep. I love that. Like, I didn't expect you to explain Don't it so deep. well. <laughs> oh my God, that was so deep. I oh, can't wait to ask you more questions around kindness later. But um, <laughs> all right, finally, R&B music or dance music? This one, is a, this one is a big dilemma, R&B music. Just, I think, because I've, I've been listening to it for a lot longer. You know, I grew up, I grew up listening to R&B, uh, hip hop, you know, dancing, dancing to it. So I love my R&B and hip hop. I just find, though, that with R&B and hip hop, the modern stuff doesn't really doesn't really ring with me. Uh, it's more the it's more the older classic R&B is what I is what I love. So I love it. I love that about that. But um, but I love the I love the dance. I love the high energy stuff. You know, I love to work out. You know, so you know, I, yeah, I love that. I love the dance music. And yeah, you know, dance music is something that I I feel is continuing to evolve. And that's what I love about it. You know, R&B is more in the past and I love the classics and I don't want to change that. Whereas dance music is something that is innovative. And, and so what's awesome. the winner? Is it dance or R&B? I'm confused. R&B, R&B though. R&B. Oh, R&B yeah, is yeah, the winner. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah. the funny story is that I run an agency called Red and Black Solutions. Change your agency to <laughs> black and yellow. <laughs> yeah, you didn't listen to me anyway. You Thank just you. went and changed it to a sing angel. So it's no really coloring. Thank you so much. I love those answers. It really got, we got to know Jeff, you know, this is exactly what I mean. That's why I ask specific questions that are related to my guests because it's just funny, you know. All Great right. questions. Now, Great back questions. To, yeah. Just finally, one of my last question for around the business side of thing is that if I was a corporate client and I'm like, all right, I want to get some help with LinkedIn, you know, like mm. what would be kind of your process? What happens from there? You know, what do you do? Where do you take me to? Well, first of all, it's understanding what they want out of 
LinkedIn in, in the first place, right? So if it's they want if they want leads, then you know there would be a certain flow that we would take them through to understand what it takes from them and what you know what it takes from us to be able to achieve that goal. Some clients just want brand awareness and just want to be like an influencer, and that's important to them. Some clients you know, just don't want, don't want really any activity in their LinkedIn uh, profile at all. They just want content to be shared and, and other clients just want to use their LinkedIn network as a way to promote company events. You know, like nowadays it's like webinars or online events and, and things like that. So the first step would really be to understand what is the objective that they want to achieve. And then the next step is, is identifying them. What are the potential uh, gains and, and, and losses from having someone to to manage their campaign and also what time what types of uh, effort is required on their end because at the end of the day you know we're working with other people's uh, profiles right and to me that's way more important than sort of doing something from a company brand because there's a real person there's a real face behind who you're working with so from our end we've got to be make it a hundred percent sure that we are representing the the person in the right manner, but also if the if the if the person or the client wants us to do something that we feel is unethical, then at the same time we also have to say no to that as well and explain to why we're not comfortable, you know, doing doing those types of activities and, and things like that. So you know, once we get once we get an agreement on that, then we build a plan or a strategy which we work through and that they sign off. There's a huge security component to working with other people's accounts as well, right? Because at the end of the day, LinkedIn actually has guidelines saying you are not allowed to share your login details with other people. So we've got a whole host of security uh, tools that enable us to log into a, a person's account without them having to you know, physically uh, share their login details with us, which is really important. We've got tools that will log in to an account using the same IP address that our client is, is based in because an, another key thing is, you know, if you're based in Sydney and then LinkedIn notices logins from Philippines or Vietnam or India, then they'd be going, what's, what's going on here? And, and that can, that can cause some red flags and cause your account to be suspended and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's really important there. I mean, it's also important to set up a policy and guidelines for your, your team members and, and letting know people who work, you know, for you, understand how serious it is to and, and how privileged we are client allowing us to work in their their LinkedIn profile and, and then making sure that you know these are yes we can we can do this activity and these are absolute no we cannot we cannot do activity. And then the other thing as well is to make sure that we have a way to segment the activity and the connections that the client has versus the activity and the connections that we'll be making for the, for the clients. Because a big part of it is, a big part of our clients working with us, they're afraid that we're gonna see messages or see communication you know, that's private in nature. So you know, there's gotta be policies and guidelines in place that protect the client to say, this is, these are the steps that we'll go through to ensure that we keep your, your privacy private. But just know that these are the these are the activities and areas of your LinkedIn profile that we will be working on in order to meet your objectives and getting the client to agree to those. That is really interesting, and I think that's why corporate clients, if you're listening to this, you need to work with with Jeff because I think it's like I wouldn't be able to think of all those things or, or know what's right or wrong. But I guess because you've got so much experience working with big companies, you know their requirements, you know what it takes to working relationship that's going to achieve the outcome. Um, yeah, yeah, 100%. And, and that's why, you know, we're not the first and the only agency that, that specializes in, in this. There's been many that have sort of popped up and gone away over the years. And, and I would attribute this as, as part of the main factors because they haven't taken the time to be secure and, and set up the right policies within their organization and with the client, make sure that their legal foundations are, are set up so that it, it protects you know, everyone involved. Because it, all it takes is one person to report you as spam or you know, one person to have a negative setting against your name and that can completely suspend your account. Uh, and then that kills any trust that you have yeah. with the client as well, right? So yeah, it's, it's something that, that we take very, very seriously. Cool, so how do people get in contact with you if they're interested? 
to sure. explore, learning more. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we just talked on this podcast that LinkedIn is my jam. So I think the best thing for people to do is connect with me on, on LinkedIn. So just type in Jeff Yang in LinkedIn uh, or, or social gen on LinkedIn, please connect with me. And the reason why I love that form of uh, initial communication is because, you know, by connecting with me, you know, my network may offer you and your business some value, but also your network could offer me and my business some value as well. So we're already in a, in a bit of a win-win relationship in that way. And then, of course, you can always reach out to me or, or learn more about uh, LinkedIn activity from what I do and, and my posts and the activity that me and my team have on SocialGen. The other way to get in touch with us is via our website www.socialgen.com.au. You can have a look at our sort of service offerings on the site and then there's a, you can contact us on the contact us form or give us a call. Awesome. You know, like I, the reason why I invited you on this podcast, because I know you're the kindest and generous person in the world. And so I do believe everything you said Thank there, you. you are really all about serving. So this leads me to my second and last question is what does a kind boss mean to you? A kind boss means to me is, is a, a person who understands their employees, right? Is understands their values, uh, takes the time to understand their their strengths, you know, their weaknesses, and individualizes their communication to that that person. You know, I, I've seen and I've worked in environments where it's a one size fits all type of communication, and then you sort of see some people flourishing because that sort of communication works for them. But then you see other people who are quite gifted and talented fall by the wayside as, as well. So, you know, I think being kind is not the conventional sense of being generous and liking everybody. It's, it's really understanding and taking the time to understand the people that, that work with you, respect them, respect their, respect their views and give them their opportunity to, to shine, contribute. That's sort of uh, my view on being a kind boss. Oh, so beautiful. Okay, well, <laughs> this leads me to my last question is, what do you want the world to remember Jeff for? Uh, I just, I want the world to remember me as just someone who is, is fun loving, you know, someone who is here to add value to everyone that I, that I come across, you know, if, whether it's being able to help them or not. But, you know, if I can, if I can introduce you to other people or if I can add value to it in some way, I'd like to be, I'd like to be known as, as someone who always took the time and effort to, to understand you and to add value in any way I can. Yeah. And you definitely have added a lot of value to my life. So thank you so much for being you on too, my Lynn. podcast. You too, Lynn. <laughs> it's always fun chatting with you. So I'll see you again next time. All right. Virtual hug. Virtual oh, hug. And oh, I was going to go black. Oh, 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 oh my God. Do you know what? What? Black and yellow, black and yellow. Black and yellow. <laughs> You're literally wearing black and I'm wearing yellow. Oh my God. There you go. <laughs> Meant to be. See, see Lynn, we just have this connection. Thank you for joining our podcast today. We hope this interview has inspired and humbled you to be a kind boss. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and let us know what you think about our show. If you have any questions, please visit OutsourcingAngel.com. Until then, stay kind and spread love.